Well, thank you. Thank you. Here we are in slightly different circumstances from usual. Um, I'm starting off um, in uh, China in the 17th century. Um, at that time, the Jesuits uh, from Europe came over as missionaries. And they got on very well with the Confucians there. They, 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 wore, they wore Chinese clothes, they spoke Chinese, and they, 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 they did well with, with the Confucians. Uh, but um, and the Confucians really took in everything. They weren't upset, as people had been in Europe, by uh, about Galileo's ideas, or the, uh, the, the Earth being round, or the, uh, the, the various seasons and things. Um, but one thing really stuck in their throats. They could not get into their head the idea of a god uh, in a tiny quarter of the universe that he had created in one of the seven heavens um, and as a, as a distant figure. They said, you know, the, 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 the Jesuits, they understand things very well but they don't understand what they call the qi. Uh, in China, uh, we'll, we'll see in a moment, that the qi was not a, a god in heaven. The, the sacred, it was a sacred force that flowed through all things, that uh, it, it inspired, it was in, in everything, it pervaded the earth. It was not a, a god in a distant heaven, or a person even, even a personal god, but it was, it was a sacred force. And they said, uh, the Jesuits are very, are very good about science, but they don't understand the qi. Um, and some years back before that, uh, when the Crusaders was, had started to arrive in the Holy Land, and uh, lots of pilgrims were coming out to, to the Holy Land, uh, the Greek Orthodox were really puzzled to see the ecstasy. When they arrived in the Holy Land, they would burst into tears, <laughs> fling themselves on the ground and kiss the ground and say, this is holy, this, uh, this is the Holy Land, and crawl on all fours and to, to make the most of it. And, um, and they said, what on earth are they doing? <laughs> Don't they understand that all land is holy? Their land is just as holy as ours. Uh, so the West, quite early, went off into a, a different tangent. And then, of course, when we started to rule the Earth, uh, things have beca become rather bad for the environment. And I'll, I'll look at that, it, that in a moment. Um, now, um, so the, the Chinese, for example, as I've said, saw uh, the, the sacred as a force. It was neither uh, physical nor wholly spiritual. Uh, it flowed through all things. Uh, it, create, it was in constant motion, bringing things into being and, other, and letting other things go to one side, constantly roiling. And it was present in all things. And in India, too, it was a very, very similar uh, idea of what they called Rita. Uh, or later they'd call it Brahman, um, another force that goes through, that is in all things, that is active in all things. Um, it, that, they, that, that Brahman uh, wasn't created by a god, Brahman created the gods. As, just as God, uh, Brahman created the, uh, the, the mountains and the, the sea and the fish, and was in constant motion, uh, keeping the earth in being, constantly a sacred force, constantly in touch. Um, and so uh, th this, the West had gone off in a different direction. Now, Thomas Aquinas, in the 12th century, he understood this, um, but he was writing in rather dry Aristotelian prose. The, by this time, the the Europeans had just discovered Aristotle. Um, 
when they when they they had gone down to Spain because they they'd never they the, uh, in the dark ages they remembered Plato but all Aristotle's work had been lost and they recovered Aristotelian and Aristotelian science by going down to Spain where the Muslims who'd uh, translated Aristotle into uh, into Arabic and studied Aristotle uh, that, that could teach them about Aristotle uh, and uh, so they, it was the big craze. Everyone was thrilled to be, this was the biggest, newest thing. And Thomas Aquinas was full of Aristotle. The trouble with Aristotle, excellent though he was in many ways, is that he's, he's rather a, a boring, prosaic writer. <laughs> um, where the, uh, the other which would talk about Chi or, uh, or Brahman in terms of poetry, um, and in music and in dance, uh, they did it in Aristotelian prose, which rather put a dampener on things. <laughs> um, and so, um, the, so, the, uh, they, so the, there was a real uh, divide between, from a very early age between the West and the rest of the world. And of course, uh, when we became very, very powerful, we took, we sent uh, this uh, uh, limited view of, of, of the divine into, took with us missionaries, and uh, so the thing has gone on. Um, but uh, the, the, the Chinese were not alone, of course, uh, because uh, in, in India, the same force was Rita, as I said, or later they would call it Brahman. And it too, and, or, uh, just, just the Chinese would also call it Dao, the way things are, the way things really are. Uh, and it, it's, it's ineffable. You can't seal it down and say it, it, the Dao is over there, or like you can say that God is in the heavens, uh, because uh, the, it, it is everywhere. It keeps everything in being um, and is in all things. So all things, therefore, are sacred, and that, of course, includes the things of nature. Um, and um, but so this is a kind of, as I say, an archetypal idea because it emerges too in the monotheistic religions. You f have it in Jewish Kabbalah. They don't they, they're, they're, their mystical uh, experience also shows a kind of force a sacred force that is ubiquitous and everywhere, just, just rather like Brahma. Uh, that. And similarly, the Greeks. The Greeks never lost their uh, pagan view of sacred nature because uh, Artemis, the great goddess Artemis, was one of the most powerful gods in the Greek world. She was the goddess of nature, and she was in everything, in ev invisible, you never saw her, but she was there in every plant, in every tree, in every rock, in the sea. And even though they didn't believe in Artemis anymore, the Christians had imbibed this view of nature, and so the Greek Orthodox never quite lost that uh, view of nature as, as, as we did in the West. Um, and um, so this, um, this, this, this sacred force that is, you can't define it, you can't see it, but it is everywhere, uh, that is really uh, our God stuck in a small corner of, as the Chinese uh, thought of, of, the, of the universe that he, he had supposedly created. Uh, it's, it's lost. Our Father who art in heaven, we say. Um, and uh, he heaven it, they had become a very distant thing, a di very different place, distant place by the 17th century. So it was quite easy to lose sight of, of, of God. Um, but also in the Greek Orthodox remembered uh, Artemis, and, and it, appeared, it appears very much in the monk who is very who is very well known in the West at first, Thomas Aquinas quotes him constantly. He's called Dennis the Areopagite uh, after Saint Paul's first convert, first in Greece. Uh, he it was a pseudonym. We don't know who, who what his real name was, 
But he had this view of, of sacred nature, uh, a force uh, that, that, except he didn't quite see it as rolling out in a sort of way. It was a sort of like a constant explosion into the world, like a, like a kind of orgasm. Uh, that was that was constantly keeping the world in being, uh, constantly uh, invigorating everything. So, uh, sacred. So, the, but we were going off, as I say, in a different direction, uh, st starting with the Aristotelian notion, and this started to get uh, really uh, serious um, in the, the, about the 17th century. Uh, when you have uh, Bacon, 16th century Bacon was, uh, who said that, uh, that God had said, after all, he says, in the book of Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis, he said to Adam, take the earth and subdue it. Take the earth and conquer it. And Adam, said Bacon, Adam sinned. And he did not do what God told him. He did not subdue the earth. But we now, modern people, we can subdue the earth. We can do what God wants and make the earth uh, sub inferior to us, make it our servant. Um, and later, of course, the philosophers, Descartes, for example, who saw, who, uh, saw nature as nature was no longer sacred. He said, my aim is to make it so that uh, when you see uh, a flower or a star, you will no, no longer wonder at it. You'll no longer be filled with awe and wonder and mystery uh, because it's just a thing. It's, it, it, it is just an inanimate thing. And we must look at all the, all the things of nature as inanimate. And his God was, uh, he saw, imagined God as up in the heavens, creating the earth, rather like a scientist, putting everything together and setting everything up, and then going, disappearing back to heaven, and the earth is now uh, working, on, working on its own. So uh, we, that was... That, that was moving quite fast, far away from the, from the traditional way, as we were, and we used this, this new science of ours to make ourselves in the West what we became, a, a world leader, and taking our, our scientific view of the world uh, with us into other parts. Uh, but in places like India and China, the old, idea of God has not, complete, has not completely died. It, it, it is still there, very much so. Um, and, uh, but for us, that, that notion of a, of, a, of a God that is everywhere, my catechism as a child said, where is God? And the answer was, God is everywhere. But somehow, he wasn't. He was in heaven. Um, and he was, a, he was distant. And one felt this distance, and one could never get to him. Whereas, you know, if you're used to sort of looking at nature properly, you see the divine in every tree, in every bird, in the sky, in the stars, everywhere. God is, ev where is God? God is everywhere, but we no longer see it like that. Um, and so um, the Muslims uh, in, uh, of, the, of the three monotheists have the best view of nature. Um, they see God as the creator, but they still, um, but they revere uh, nature. And if you think that is really very remarkable in that the Quran was composed in what is now Saudi Arabia, in that hideous climate. Um, and the, uh, the, the Arabs before the coming of Islam had no time for nature at all. Not surprisingly, they could, they could not in that sterile country produce enough food for everybody. So they had to uh, steal food from one another. And it, it, they, you had to do it very carefully. You couldn't just 
go and kill everybody and then take off their... Because if you did that, you'd have a vendetta and they'd come back for you. The skill was to go into the homes and get the stuff at, without killing anybody. Uh, it was the only way that they were able to survive. And, and t then you get the Quran uh, praising the glories of nature, uh, making, and whereas uh, we in the West are most impressed by miracles, we love miracle stories where the, where the, where the rules of nature get turned upside down or, or, or don't work anymore, so things, odd things happen. Oh, the, 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 so and we think that's miraculous and a, and a sign of God, but uh, in in at the Quran is far closer to uh, the Chinese and and the Indians in that respect. Uh, it sees the hand of God in in nature itself, and and it you know that every morning that the sun rises, and every night it sets, and and this this is God. The trouble with the Quran is that people in the West read it in translation, um, and you're not meant to read it. It is, uh, it is, it is chanted and it, it sung, um, and it, 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 the, the the Arabic is extremely beautiful, and which we don't we don't see, and it is sung, chanted, and it's a great skill to be able to recite the Quran in, in, in that way. And people have, they have competitions to see who can, who can do it best. It's a, it's a very great art. Uh, but so people, when people say, well, I've read the Quran, and they, they say it in a very sort of, uh, I know it all way, I say, well, you haven't. Uh, you're not supposed to read it. You're supposed, you're supposed to listen to it. Um, and, and the beauty of the sound it speaks to you. That's just a bit of an, uh, a sort of little divergence there. Um, so this arc, but this archetypal notion was is there in humanity, and I think we see it very strongly in the Romantic poets of the 19th century, uh, because in at that time in the early 19th century, people like Wordsworth and Coleridge were very much alarmed at the way industry and, uh, was, uh, was uh, thriving and how we, we were getting more into towns and cities and we're going even farther away from nature. And uh, in, he said, as a young boy, he used to be intoxicated with the glories of nature. Um, and I remember that myself as a child. Uh, when I was very, very little, I could see, it, when we went into the woods uh, around my home in Worcestershire, I could see a, a light, a sort of strange light, a luminousness in the trees. In the, and I kept on pointing it out to my parents. I didn't have much vocabulary at that time, so I called it Pooch, Pooch. And they said, yes, dear. Um, and, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and um, you know, and they, and they said, I, "She's pretending she's seeing the fairies." You know, the, in my face. Well, no, it's Putsch, I said, very indignantly. But of course, when I went to school, uh, like Wordsworth, uh, the light and glory died away, and as Wordsworth says, and faded into the light of common day. I, as I was inducted into the rationalistic uh, viewpoint that we have here in the West. Um, but so, but anyway, Wordsworth taught himself, he says, and he says it in his wonderful poem, Tintin Abbey, he taught himself to look at nature differently. And what he came up with is exactly like Chi or Brahman or Tao. He says, for I have learned to look on nature, not as I did as a young boy, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh, <laughs> no, <laughs> nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, 
and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that informs all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. Now that is Chi Brahman Dao. It's, it's, it's in us. It's there in our humanity uh, if, if we can only look for it. It's, it's, some, it's a sort of archetypal idea that is, that is fundamental to us. Um, and um, so, uh, and he's, he's quite clear that this isn't God. Because notice he, he, he said he called, he is quite happy to write about God in, in other poems, but not this. Because God has come to mean something very different, that being way up in the sky, far out of our reach, or looking down upon us. Uh, he calls it something. Now, we use the word something, don't we, very loosely. What, what, what shall we have for supper? I, well, I don't know, eggs or something. But Wordsworth uses language very precisely. And it's something. We haven't got a name for it. But it's something. Do look at that uh, poem if you can find it, because uh, that, that, that says it, that has it all. Uh, it's in the book, in the poem Tintin Abbey. Now, he says he's learned to look on it, and we can do that too, as I, I believe. And so in my book, um, it's a sort of how-to book in a sense, because I look at the way people looked at nature in the past. And then in the, the, there's a, the, the end of the, each chapter, there's a place called the, the way forward, how we can translate that into our daily lives. And um, so that one of the things is, for example, to sort of try and look at nature differently. We don't often look at it these days. I mean, I don't know how often have you gone to a place of natural beauty and seen uh, somebody marching up by the sea, for example, on his, talking on his iPhone, uh, or else taking endless photographs of, of, of this wonderful uh, view. Um, they can't possibly look at them all. I mean, you know, they're, they're far too many. But they prefer, they, we seem to prefer an artificial, a man-made a uh, replica of nature rather than being in nature's presence itself. Uh, we're not doing that. Yet. And it's the same. I'm in the, I work quite a lot in the British Museum. And then it's exactly the same thing going on in there. People come, there's the Rosetta Stone. And what do they do? We take about 20 photographs of it. Um, instead of saying, this is the Rosetta Stone, or this, this, these people, this is from ancient Egypt. I'm in the presence of something else. Uh, we're, not, we're looking at nature increasingly, uh, withdrawing from it into a sort of virtual world. So um, I have tried to suggest, as I say, in, in each of the, uh, these um, chapters, things that you could do. For example, when we're talking about the chi, just spend a 10 minutes a day to start with, turning off your phones, sitting in your garden or in a park or if you're lucky enough to live in the countryside, and look at nature. See all the insects and the life and the birds and the sounds just for 10 minutes. No phone, uh, no, no books just sitting in the presence of nature. And you can up your, uh, up your uh, uh, time uh, as, as you go on, but just to, re to reconnect. That's, that is basic, because we are seem to be retreating from it in, at an alarming and very peculiar rate. But another, another way of, of looking at this is, is, is the golden rule. Uh, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. That, as I, I've written in elsewhere, is one of the, the great sort of symbols, uh, the, great, the great teachings, and it's in every single world religion seen as the essence of conduct and spirituality. Why? Because you have to look into your own heart, discover what gives you pain, and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. 
do not impose on others, said Confucius, what you yourself do not desire. Uh, Confucius, as far as we know, was the first to uh, enunciate the golden rule and say it was essential to his teaching. And later Confucians, where they call themselves neo no, later, before the Neo-Confucians, Mencius, a couple of centuries later, said, yes, Confucius is talking very much about human beings, and that is very important that we treat all people as we would wish to be treated ourselves. But this also applies to the things of nature, what he calls the one woo. Uh, and that's, in, in English, it's always translated the things of nature. Now, we use the word thing, don't we, to de describe, to point to something that's really a bit, bit inanimate, uh, that's just, uh, or, or that hasn't really got a name or an identity, or, uh, but it, 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 it's not a, certainly not a living thing, as it is for the Chinese, who have cultivated a sense that everything has a life of its own that has to be respected. Now, that doesn't mean we start anthropomorphizing everything and uh, sort of talking to nature as though it can talk back to us or put, you know, what they call the, 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 the pathetic fallacy of feeling, you know, pu pu you know, putting our feelings into nature. No, it means just looking, being in the presence of nature and sensing its difference, uh, its majesty. Um, and it's, it's our, uh, it, we are dependent upon it for the entire time, uh, everything, we, everything we breathe and live. So to spend uh, time, uh, the, uh, the Neo-Confucians in the 11th century really went a lot on this. And uh, they said every single thing and of course, they, for them, a thing is not just a dead thing, it's filled with sacred life. Every single thing has a, a particular, a particular uh, nature. And we mustn't say, oh, and, and start talking to flowers and trees, uh, because they've got a different nature from ours. Uh, they, they resp their, their life is is pulsing within each, each tree, each flower, each insect, but it's different from ours. And we must recognize that. There's a tree I have when I'm sitting in, in my desk uh, at home, uh, and I live in the middle of London, and, and it's tr you know, there's not much nature going on there. But um, in the next street, there's a massive tree that is in, in a schoolyard and it rises above the, the, the houses opposite me. And I watch, and it's directly opposite my desk at the top of the house. And I sometimes make myself watch this tree for about, for a while. And you start seeing, especially, it's not so good in the summer when it's, cut, when it's full of leaves, but when you see, it, when it, as it starts paring itself down, you see how it changes in color, texture. You see all the creatures that are coming into it, the, the absolute teeming life in that tree, but it's different from us, just as a wasp has a different uh, reality from us uh, and uh, that is utterly mysterious to us, uh, that we, 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 you know, the, the, all those children's books which have, uh, you know, animals dressed as in human clothes and uh, chatting, it doesn't do any harm. But we should now start uh, 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 recognizing the sacred difference in, in every tree and every flower. And that's the Neo-Confucians were very, very strong on that. They, one of them said that every single thing, which again does not have that sort of deadening concept that we have for a thing, it has its own life, its own integrity, its own uh, nature. And we must study this uh, and trying to understand it, study it scientifically, intellectually, and recognize that other life that is there all around us in everything. And we can start doing that, just noticing uh, as we sit in the garden, 
the birds, for example, who have an entire, they're, they're, a lo entirely different life from us. Uh, and, and, and the insects and, and, and the leaves just reconnecting with nature, just for a start, 10 minutes a day. The Chinese called it quiet sitting. Uh, that didn't mean you had to sit in the yogic position or anything. Uh, you can just sit comfortably uh, and in a relaxed way, but put away your phones. Well, they didn't have phones in those days, but they put away their books and their scrolls and just watched, listened. Uh, Wordsworth said, have a heart, cultivate a heart that watches and receives. Watch and receives. Um, so, um, the, so, so the Neo-Confucians, I, I, I love them, and in my book, uh, there's, they're, they're, they appear uh, really quite frequently, especially in the last chapter. And <clears throat> there's another thing that, 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 they, 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 that we have <coughs> to, <coughs> there's, one of my chapters is called Concentric Circles. That, uh, as, and this is something that the Chinese developed again. Uh, and th what they would do was sit in the, in the center of their own circle, in the center of their own life, in their own uh, society, but then go outwards, moving outwards to uh, other things, the things of nature. Uh, entering into that um, and entering into the difficult things, entering to the sky, the birds, uh, the storms, uh, be, be just becoming aware, uh, moving your mind out. You start perhaps with yourself, but then go slowly out, so perhaps your children, then to animals, which are near, closest to us, then to insects or fish, then further out to grass, and leaves, and just recognizing that and that sacrality that is in that is, as Wordsworth said, in all things. Um, and um, so, but that, that, that's just one of the one of the practices, and a, a great practice in the ancient world, which ne really needs to be mis mis uh, to be understood properly, is sacrifice. Now, we instantly become rather sort of touchy about this and say how cruel it is to sacrifice animals. Uh, we don't seem to spend the same amount of time uh, lamenting the millions of beasts who are slaughtered every day quite heartlessly in our abattoirs without anybody taking any notice. Uh, in the ancient world, you really didn't, didn't eat red meat unless it was sacrificed, unless it was made holy. But in India, they became so squeamish about this that they, they used to let the animal go in the end. Uh, they sacralized it, made it holy, but often they would give it to one of the priests as, 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 as a gift. Uh, but the, the idea is it's to, to make holy, to recognize the absolute sacrality in everything, everything around us. Um, and um, I, that's, we, that's something that we should be looking at, that every single flower and tree and plant and insect has its own sacred life, its own holiness. Sacred uh, means other, uh, separate. So it's different from ours, no anthropomorphizing there. Um, and uh, so... <coughs> To make holy, uh, the, 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 in, in India they had these tremendously complex rituals which, to, which, which honored nature, but very few people could attend these. These were just really for very, very learned priests. But the, the ordinary people uh, were told to make sacrifice says in another way, that this didn't mean killing anybody, sacrum facere it comes from, to make holy. So a person was told, everyone was supposed to uh, honor every single person you met during the day. 
in India, as you know, they will bow like that, and recognizing that holiness. And you are to welcome uh, any guest to your house, whether you like him or her or not, with uh, and wait upon him, uh, treat him with utter respect or her with utter uh, happiness and joy as if to see her and reverence. Uh, whatever, whoever it is, you must in, at every moment of the day honor every guest that you encounter and the same in the street. And also, um, you must uh, remember the dead. Remember that just every day in the dead, uh, they, they, would, they would have a fire, a sacred fire in each home, and they would perhaps throw some incense or something into it as it would go to, up to heaven. Or just, but just to remember the dead, the sacrality of the dead, once a day in our lives, just, just to remember that. Um, and um, to, um, uh, they, they said you did scriptural study. Now, that did not mean you took out your Rig Veda or the Bible or do a lot of uh, work in that way. No, uh, because <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> it's because, this, because every single uh, thing that you encounter is holy. So you can just sit quietly. You, could have, you might have a poem, say, a, 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 a favorite poem, just for 10 minutes a day, with your eyes on the horizon, letting the sounds of nature in, and as it were, saying thank you to nature uh, with, with a poem, just bringing it into our lives. We need that because we have so sidelined the natural world. It, it, it doesn't re it, it's a sort of background to us, uh, not something on which we depend. Holiness, one of the things about what makes things holy, uh, is uh, something we've lost, a sen lost the touch with it, really. But it's, uh, it means, one of its meanings is that it, it, we have within ourselves a feeling of utter dependence upon it. And we utterly depend upon nature for every breath that we take. Uh, and we're seeing now disturbances in nature and beginning to find life uncomfortable. But the thing to do is to recognize when things are normal that this is holy. This is sacred, special, precious, and on which we absolutely depend. <laughs> And to bring these thoughts into our minds at various parts of the day, just perhaps reading a poem, for example, or taking time to sit in the garden or the park for 10 minutes, just taking nature in, uh, that, that those are things that we, we can do. So also the Jains. The Jains had a, a very um, uh, strict and view of nature. Uh, they revered it so much that they were very, very fearful, fe very fearful indeed of hampering it in any way, harming it. Um, and they, so a Jane would, will walk very, very carefully to make sure that uh, it doesn't tread on uh, an insect or swat, it would never swat a fly or um, it, uh, j some, some Janes go rather too extreme, I feel. They just never move. Uh, they, they stand there and virtually starve themselves to death. I think that is just get, taking things a little too far. But just being careful as to watch it. There's a lovely, I quote it in the book, there's a lovely piece in, in the wonderful novel Tristram Shandy, uh, by uh, Lawrence Stern in the 18th century, one of the very first English novels. It's a, an extraordinary book. Um, and uh, one of the characters is a, a man called Uncle Toby. He's a very lovable, dear character, the, the, the hero's uncle. And the, 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 the narrator, Tristram Shandy, he, he says he'll never forget the time that one day uh, he was standing, he was, there was at lunch, 
and this fly was buzzing around and you know buzzing around him going round and round the table and and he and he, this had been annoying everybody but eventually uncle toby got got him and he carried him out instead of swatting him and, you know <laughs> carried him out talking to it gently saying now dear fly thou hast as much right to live as i and uh, then gently opens the window and lets the fly out um, and, um, and, and the narrator says, uh, the narrator Tristan Rashani says, he never forgot that, that somehow, and I think that's something we could all do instead of just swatting the, the, the beast, little beast or, or, or wasp or something, look at that other life that is precious and learn to respect it, different from ours. And, and, and we're not to anthropomorphize them or uh, attribute human feelings with them or give them names or pet names or anything. Um, just look at it. I was once, uh, I remember, I used to go quite a lot to a, a sort of resort, a sort of holiday intellectual resort in America called Chautauqua. You may have seen it on the news because that was where Salman Rushdie was, was shot at. Um, sure. Uh, so, uh, but and I was sitting there. Uh, we were sitting, uh, having drinks on the porch in the evening, and in, a, a, a wasp fell into the wine glass of one of my neighbours. We all looked at this thing buzzing around in the wine, and uh, a Buddhist was sitting with us, and he said, "I'll take this. I'll see to this," and he took it out into the kitchen and came back with a fresh glass of wine, and he said, and the wasp is fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but we can all do something like that, just recognizing that this, these things have life, that they are themselves sacred, just taking ourselves out of this anthropocent anthropocentric worldview. Um, now, um, and there's also, uh, and I think, a... Uh, something that we could, a, a Buddhist exercise, uh, that we could all perform. Uh, when people do yoga, uh, we see them going into themselves and uh, sort of becoming sort of peaceful and calm and all the rest of it. Uh, but this was not what yoga was like in, at the time of the Buddha. If you wanted to uh, become a sort of an ascetic or you were interested in, in learning yoga, you went out into the forest and there you studied with a guru. And you were not allowed to start yoga, uh, let alone, you couldn't even sit in the yogic position until you'd been through a very stringent moral program. And top of the list of that moral program was the Indian virtue of ahimsa, nonviolence or harmlessness. So if you were seen swatting a fly, you went right down to the bottom of the class. No, if you spoke an untidy, uh, unkind word or made an impatient <coughs> gesture, you were not allowed to sit in that position until you could look at all things with equanimity and respect. You could not even begin yoga. And we are, when we see the Buddha, uh, it often he seems to be looking down in, deeply inside himself, as if he's going right down into the depths of his inner world, his inner soul. Uh, but the, tech, the, the Buddhist texts tell us something different. That what he was doing was sending, think, extending his mind to every corner of the earth and not leaving it until he could feel respect and affection for every single creature within it. Whether, uh, they, they, you know, even, even a fly or even things that are unpleasant. But extending that uh, affection to it. Uh, there's a story about the Buddha that when he was a child, uh, his, uh, he was taken with his family to see the 
cut the plowing of the first plowing of the field at the beginning of the agricultural year, which was a sort of big festival and a big celebration. And uh, he, he, he was a little boy and he was left in the care of his nurses. And uh, his nurses, however, sort of abandoned the child and went off to watch the plowing. And the Buddha, uh, little boy, he looked and he saw that the plow had torn up plants and uh, in some of the insects had been killed in the process. And his heart was filled with sorrow for them. And in that moment, he, ascend, he, uh, he said to ascend uh, to a high yogic stance in that sense of pity and love for other creatures. But you could, uh, he, so in his uh, bid for enlightenment, he would not leave each uh, district uh, in the world, each of the four corners of the world, until he could feel equanimity and respect for everything, even unpleasant, evil things, uh, to feel respect and uh, honor. And that was how he achieved nirvana, enlightenment, in, in that way. And uh, there's a, a story that, uh, the, that one day the Buddha was preaching, and some forest people came to talk to him. And they said, you know, look, we, we can't do all this yoga stuff. We, we, we're rough people. We're the, the yoga, we haven't got time for any of this. Buddha said, don't worry. Um, and he gave them a prayer to say. Uh, it, it's a prayer in the, in, the, in the ancient Pali canon. He said, just extend your sympathies out to others, leaving yourself behind and feeling respect honor and affection for everything around you, starting the, with those near you and then going further, like the Buddha, as the Buddha did, further and further away until you can feel equanimity. And let all beings be happy is the prayer. Uh, it's at the end of the book. And I think we should say it every, on ourselves to the bus of, sm of high, middle or low estate, alive, or still to be born. May they all be perfectly happy. May our loving thoughts fill the entire world above, below, behind, reaching uh, all things with equanimity and love. It's a nice prayer. Uh, you can just think, say it to yourself on the bus, but extending our sympathies out to people we like or people we don't like this is the way to do it, not looking within, not yogaring unless you're, unless you're also doing, you know, because don't sit in the yogic position if you've been unpleasant to somebody today. Uh, because this is, this, is, this is, you know, you'd have been, wouldn't have been, been allowed to start in, in, in ancient India. But the, it, that is getting the perspective out, it's getting rid of the self that ego that makes ourselves all feel so uh, sort of uh, present and, and important. And I finished the book, I started with Wordsworth, and I finished the book with the ancient mariner, with Coleridge, Wordsworth's great friend. And I never liked that poem much at school. We had to sort of, uh, we had, all had to learn it by heart and draw pictures of various bits of it in, uh, and hand it in. I never, I, now I've got it. Like Wordsworth, he's worried about nature. And uh, you know the story, of course, the, you know, the, the ancient, this eight old soldier, a sailor rather, uh, accosts a wedding guest, that unfortunate guy who was hoping to go to the wedding and gets taught, t told this long, sad story uh, about his, how his life changed. And he was, he was a sailor, and he's, uh, he goes, uh, his ship sails, and they get becalmed in the Antarctic re region. And then suddenly, out of the blue, an albatross appears. And, and it's a, a, a large white bird with long, slender wings, and it appears on the ship. 
and it becomes the ship's mascot. And it, lead, it flies with the ship and it leads it out of the, this icebound sea. And it becomes absolutely loved by, by all the sailors. Uh, and, and then uh, the wedding guest notices that, this, that the mariner has grown very, very pale. What's the matter with you, he said. Why ailst thou so? And the mariner replies, with my shot bow, crossbow, I shot the albatross. And, you know, and he never, there's no reason for it. Uh, it probably, probably hadn't got a reason. He might have just done it out of sheer carelessness. But this is what we do all day long. You know, we chuck things away uh, without thinking what we're doing. Uh, we, tram we, you know, s s step on flies. Uh, we, we, you know, we, uh, we, we are not noticing what we're doing. We don't notice what we're damaging. And to make ourselves aware uh, that, 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 that that breaks the bond of, that we have with nature. And of course, you know the story. Eventually, the, the mariner comes to his senses. It's a, been a it was a terrible trial, and the, the crew all die. And, uh, and uh, he looks into the sea. And he, he's still filled with such anger and loathing of what's happened that he looks at the sea and he looks at the fishes and he sees the ugly, slimy things. They lived on and the, the, the men, the, the, his fellow mariners are all dead. They lived on and so do I. Alone, 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 all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. Uh, but one night, and Coleridge does this, is very well worth it, be there's beautiful lines in the whole thing, but it's, he does it in prose. has a little prose gloss beside it. He's how, that's how the, he looked up at, in the moon, at the moon, which he'd hitherto seen as just a rather boring, sterile planet. But he suddenly saw the moon as rather like himself, as an endless traveler, traveling through the world, uh, perhaps longing for home, as he did. And he felt an instant sympathy with it. And then he looked back at the fish and, oh, happy living things, said I. You know, no tongue, their beauty can declare. Uh, and a spring of love gushed from my heart and I blessed them unaware. A sort of, a, a sudden moment of union with those with other beasts and immediately the spell is broken. But how often we do things like shooting an albatross. For, we may not kill a bird, but swat flies, chuck things away uh, carelessly without giving these things a single thought. And it is breaking the bonds of nature, which, which will rebound upon us. So I, I, as I say, I, I re really felt when I was writing my book, for the first time, I think I thought I really understood what this book had been about, which I'd had to learn by heart at school. Um, and it's, but it is something that we sh could, should remember, because stories get to us much more in many ways than just uh, poems uh, or even uh, long discourses. The, the story stays in our mind and heart. Just notice how carelessly we, we're still leaving uh, plastic on the beach, even though we're told again and again and again that this is ab ab absolutely dangerous. We're still doing it. And we're still turning on uh, our heating when, when we don't need to. Uh, flying, I mean, I, you know, we, we, we're flying all over the place. And should we be flying all over the place? Uh, because we know it's damaging the atmosphere. So we should become aware of that. Bear the, 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 think of the albatross and the mariner, how carelessly, thoughtlessly we do things and make ourselves aware, uh, aware of what we're doing, aware that each of these objects around us, each of these things we call them around us, has, as the Chinese understood, a life of its own that is sacred. Thank you. <laughs>